Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, we will start shortly. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're based. Uh, welcome to this Diplo web debate. So we organize these debates to kind of touch on new issues and emerging practices in diplomacy. And it is clear to all of us that one of these new issues and new practices is science diplomacy. So today we meet under the broad headline, science diplomacy capacity development. Where do we go from here? I think for all of us who have gathered here today, it is clear that science diplomacy matters as a practice, that it can be a huge contribution to some of the most pressing global issues we are facing, the global pandemic or climate change, and that these interactions at the kind of science policy interface can make a huge difference in us being able to address these problems effectively. We all know about the huge positive impact science diplomacy can make. We are also aware that the concept is a little bit contested and questioned, but one thing that I think is the next really important and pressing question is how do we prepare people to become effective science diplomats? How do we prepare diplomats? How do we prepare scientists? And with that question in mind, we are meeting today. Guiding our conversation today are basically three questions. The three questions are, how can various actors be enabled to benefit from what science diplomacy has to offer? What content and what form should capacity development take? And how do we ensure that capacity development in science diplomacy has a longer term impact and allows participants to become active shapers of policies and processes in their chosen fields? Three big questions that we will address in various ways throughout the conversation. And in order to do so, we have an excellent lineup of speakers. I'm really, really happy and pleased that they were able to join us today, that they took the time to come together to have this conversation, because it is, a, it is an important conversation, and each of them is a leading practitioner in their particular field and overall in science diplomacy. So to introduce them, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. They are probably familiar to most of you, but nevertheless, I'm going to introduce them very briefly. So we have Dr. Maga Guas Soler. Um, she is the founder of Cider Global and a senior advisor to the Geneva Science Diplomacy Anticipator, Jessa. Welcome, Maga. We have uh, Nicola Zeidler. He is the executive director of the Geneva Science Policy Interface, GSPI. Then Maxim Stauffer, he's the co-founder and chief executive officer of the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance. And last but not least, Dr. Vit Nukala, who currently works at EMBO, the European Molecular Biology Organization. He previously was with the US Embassy Office of Global Affairs, the Wellcome Trust, and the Indo-US Science Technology Forum. There's a very particular context for bringing, for bringing this group of people together. And before I get into the conversation with them and with you, our audience, let me briefly give, give you a sense of that context. So one element of that context is an online training course that we launched last year in October. And by we, I mean Diplo together with GSPI and JESTA. For us at Diplo, this was the first training course in science diplomacy, building on a long experience in training and capacity building in diplomacy and technology, but the first time in science diplomacy. And it was great to have this endeavor together with uh, JESTA and um, GSPI. And the second course will launch in October this year and applications are already open. So this is one piece of the puzzle. The other piece of the puzzle is Science Diplomacy Week. Science Diplomacy Week took place in Geneva in May, so just uh, about two months ago. And it was kind of, uh, it was led by a coalition of organizations of which GSPI and Diplo were part. And the whole thing was um, spearheaded by JESTA. And again, a great opportunity for capacity development in science diplomacy and a great element to bring into this conversation as an example. And we have invited uh, Vit here because he was a participant in both of these endeavors. So while Nicola, Maxim, and Marga and I can share experiences from organizing and running these uh, science diplomacy capacity development endeavors, 
Witt has been a very active participant and it is really interesting then to hear his reflections from, from that side of science diplomacy capacity development. There's a third element which um, I would really like to highlight because I'm particularly proud of it. Out of the course that we ran in October last year, we developed a publication. And this publication brings together all the course lecturers, so we'll see Marga, Maxime, Nicola, my contributions, contributions from my colleague Pavlina, for example, who's also here with us today, but also contributions from all the course participants, reflecting on the experience, reflecting on lessons learned, but in particular, reflecting on how they take what they've learned in the course forward in their practices, in their everyday life, and how some of them even started to kind of redirect um, their career ambitions and redirect how they engage of the science policy interface. So this is the first time we're publishing. So we're publishing this publication today. This is, this is basically the launch. My colleague Pavlina is putting the link in the chat. And I'm really proud because we brought everyone together and it's a great reflection on science diplomacy capacity development from which we can learn a lot and improve for future iterations, for example. This is also a good reminder that we have a number of participants from Science Diplomacy Week and from the online course here with us today in the audience. It's really great to see you. And again, this is also a reminder that we want to make this session as interactive as possible. So we're looking for your questions and your comments in the chat. And my colleague Pavlina Itelson, who was also a lecturer in the online course on Science Diplomacy, will summarize them, bring them, to, uh, bring them together, and then bring them into our conversation. So please don't hold back in the chat with questions and comments as this conversation unfolds. Having said all of that, I would really now like to get into the discussion with our speakers today. And I actually wanna start um, with Nicola, because one thing we noticed as we were putting this publication together is that one particular concept seemed really relevant for a lot of participants we had, and this was boundary spanning. And it seemed to really inspire them to rethink how they work at, at the boundary, basically. And in order to get into this conversation um, effectively, I would basically want to ask you, what is boundary spanning? And in the context of science diplomacy and science diplomacy capacity development, um, how do you go about engaging participants on this topic? Great. Well, th thanks a lot, Katharina. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks uh, to Diplo for organizing that that exchange. I think that's very timely and useful. Um, so to your question, um, so, well, first of all, the boundaries we talk about are uh, the boundaries of science and policy. And first of all, I think before talking about spanning those boundaries, I think it's important to respect those boundaries. Um, scientists generate a lot of value in society by producing insightful uh, insights and, and robust science. And policy actors, on the other hand, also have a sort of competitive advantage in focusing on taking the best possible decisions in the face of uncertainty uh, and the complexity of uh, phenomena uh, around us. But having said that, we also, of course, need very much science to inform policymaking so that uh, policymakers can produce more efficient solutions, uh, ground uh, norms uh, and interventions, in fact, and reality maximize their effects. Uh, but when we do try to create those science policy connections, we are faced uh, quite often with a series of mismatches that are, in a way, the result of science and policymaking being quite two distinct social processes and having uh, fairly different professional cultures. Uh, and as a result, that creates uh, mistiming, miscommunications, misalignments, uh, and misuse. And well, that's where boundary spanners come in. Uh, whether they are individuals or organizations, they are actors that really work at the interface of science and policy. And, one characteristic of boundary spanners is that they usually spend most of their time actually focusing on building science policy networks, helping to set up science policy collaborations, developing trusted relationships, providing tools and advice on how best to engage, identifying opportunities and resources. Concretely, that can take the shape of 
actors uh, like the GSPI, like JESTA, um, or other actors like the Joint Research Center uh, at the European level. Uh, but also uh, there can be research centers or units with a particular focus on policy engagement, for example, or on the other hand, uh, in international organizations or NGOs, research and partnership units uh, who are focusing on science policy engagement. And of course, there are also science policy sort of formal processes like uh, the IPCC or IPBS, uh, which are sort of formal science policy interface mechanisms. And so as such, I think that, you know, boundary spanners are much more than translators of knowledge from science to policy, and they really develop a unique uh, skill set that allows them to move smoothly from one, one community to the other, sort of being neutral brokers, providing strategic advice. Now, getting back to the, the course that we, we did, I think what was fascinating and inspiring for us when engaging with participants uh, in the Science Diplomacy Week and in the uh, Science Diplomacy curriculum with Diplo is really how much people resonated with that concept and, and that function. And I think that we, thought we, we were really sort of putting a name and a set of skills um, uh, on something that many in the course had either been developing or were aspiring to develop. And another thing that I think was also striking and, and testimonies that we got was that many people had also felt sort of isolated in this aspiration. And now they sort of the course brought for some of them sort of a comfort that there is actually a community of practice on that. There is a body of knowledge, a set of resources that exist around this field of activity. And so we sort of um, got away from those experiences with, with really a sort of sense of hope and an agency on the ability to develop a, a professional career in, in that space. Yeah, and I, well, first of all, I couldn't agree more. Um, as I said, also on the concept, concept of boundary spanning, but what I really liked is uh, how you started your intervention by saying, first of all, we need to respect the boundary. I like that because if the boundary is too blurred. We also get get into, into some, some, some trouble there. So I thought that was really interesting to take away. I kind of wanted to follow up um here and basically one the we've seen in both of our work that there are a lot of people who really want to engage at the interface of science and policy um and and more concretely how do we contribute or how does gspi specifically contribute to to building that capacity because we know there's willingness mm. but what concretely do we offer can we offer basically Right. So, well, the GSPI is a boundary spanning organization for, for sure. We are a full-time actor that focuses on facilitating engagement between scientists and, and policy actors. And we do that with a specific focus on the context of the international Geneva ecosystem. So dealing with, you know, some of the major, major challenges that are being addressed here from climate change to migrations, human rights, global health, and, and many others. And so when we started, which was four years ago, uh, very, very early on, we realized that we had to go beyond just, you know, providing connections between scientists and policy actors or providing uh, funding to support science policy collaborations. And we really set a goal to help professionalize this field of science policy engagement and, and to integrate a learning and sort of capacity development di dimension across many of the activities that, that we do. So concretely, um, uh, just to give you a few examples, uh, for example, I think one of the best ways to learn is actually through concrete projects. And uh, we have an annual call for projects that's called the Impact Collaboration Program that provides not only funding, that's an important incentive, of course, for people to spend time to do science policy collaborations, but we also provide advice uh, before and during projects to researchers and policy actors. And we also reflect with the project holders on their experience, uh, what worked in that science policy collaboration, what didn't work, what, what can we learn from that? And that's that learning component associated to a call for projects is, is a very important, I think, uh, way to provide support, but also have a sort of common learning experience around that. Um, We've also developed contents such as the, the module in the Diplo 
uh, curriculum or also in the form of interactive workshops that we've been organizing, as I said before, during the Science Diplomacy Week. Or, for example, two weeks ago, we were uh, in London also organizing workshops for researchers in um, uh, Imperial College London and University College London to really not only raise awareness on what's happening in Geneva and, and how to do policy engagement with that specific environment, but also to really dive into the difficulties and what can we do about them when it comes to science policy collaborations. And lastly, um, we're also developing more and more toolkits and resources uh, based on a mix of our own experiences and what also scientific literature says about boundary spanning. And that takes the form of uh, toolkits on how best to broker knowledge, uh, formats uh, around policy briefs and also soon we're going to publish a mapping of boundary spanning mechanisms and practices in Geneva to really make um, more explicit a lot of implicit knowledge that exists in Geneva and to make it more accessible to, to people so that they feel they can engage with that space. Thank you so much. So what, what I really picked up on is this question of professionalizing science diplomacy or science diplomacy um, engagement. But what I also picked up on with Diplo also being a, Gen a Geneva-based organization, um, this question of how do we spread the conversation from Geneva to uh, engage much, much beyond that, basically. So two interesting questions that I will keep in, in, in the back of my mind. But I would like to uh, kind of deepen on, on one particular question. So when we speak about professionalizing science diplomacy, one thing that comes to my mind is that we have these very general, very broad reflections on science diplomacy, what it is, but how do we make this practical, applicable, how do we break this down to individuals in their particular context, their particular objectives, their particular experience. And with that question, I want to turn to um, Maxime, who was also a lecturer in the online course, who was also very active in Science Diplomacy Week. Uh, Maxime, from, from your perspective, how, how do we manage that? How do we kind of take this broad knowledge, for example, on boundary spanning, on uh, science diplomacy, and how do we really engage people by respecting their needs, where they're coming from, their personal context and, and their objectives. I realize this is a very challenging question, but I think it goes to the core of um, capacity development. So what are your thoughts? Thank you very much, uh, Katarina. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so this is an excellent question, uh, which is a hard nut to crack. Um, that is at the core of uh, the GSPI's mission. Uh, where I was uh, until like two weeks ago. Uh, so what I what I'm going to say like very much resonates, I think, with what Nicola said as well. Um, so when we talk about science policy or science diplomacy, um, the way we do that is notoriously stress, uh, stratospheric. Like we often talk about science and policy as like this like very general concepts. And um, the thing is, when we visit the Palais des Nations or when we visit a, un a university or an international organization. All we see are people. We see chairs and tables and walls, of course, but like all we see are just people. And uh, whatever happens is just based on what people believe and do. And therefore, like we face this this problem of having to translate these like very high level considerations into this like basically down to earth considerations for individuals. And so we we thought a bit about that in the way we we gave workshops as part of the Diplo um, course and the NDSD week, and. Um, the way we thought about this is that um, science policy or science diplomacy will have to take a specific meaning given people's contexts. And people attribute meaning depending on uh, their job, depending on their education, their values and, and beliefs and so on. So instead of structuring uh, our pedagogy according to talks and panels and then exercises, we basically reverse the logic. We get people to talk first. We get people to uh, generate associations and reflections first um, in ways that may be um, very messy, uh, maybe wrong, um, maybe overly specific or too st uh, stratospheric, to then basically respond to this messiness by giving content. And that has proven uh, much easier, I think, for participants to consume this content because they can con connect this content to these like individual associations and reflections they have based on their like own reality.
So that is one thing, kind of reversing the logic. Uh, we don't give content, we respond to the reality of individuals. Um, a second um, thing that we do is um, try to foster cross-pollination, um, is that it's not just like an individualistic exercise. Um, most of the individual contexts are very unique and, and different, um, but most of the individual contexts are also wrong and, and full with, with bugs and things to improve. And what we try to do in, in our exercises is to get people to compare the individual experiences such that they can confront and question each other and therefore like basically learn, um, learn faster. And there's one thing that we like concretely use in, in our workshops is this one, two, four exercise. Uh, we get people to reflect as an individual on their own, then they form pairs, uh, they confront their thoughts, they try to converge or they see where they diverge, they form quartets, and then they go back to the plenary. And that's a way to basically just break things down to like the most um, simple component that is just the individual in the room, then and then re-aggregate everything to, to plenary, uh, plenary discussions. Um, that's a way we've done that seems to have proven quite valuable. Um, and yeah, um, I think that's a, an answer to your question among many others. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I really, I really appreciate the answer and the kind of the specifics on, on the methodology. So what kind of stuck in my head is like reversing the way training and capacity development are perhaps traditionally done, like turn, turning the tables. I think that's really useful and also as a metaphor to keep in mind as someone who's engaged in training and capacity development. Um, Maxime, I seem to have the more challenging questions for you um, because again, I wanted to talk about um, challenges a little bit more. And as practitioners, it's always nice to participate in a training and capacity development and to have these great exchanges. But then there are sort of, sort of real life challenges that you then face once the training is complete or that you come into the training with that you already experienced. So there are institutional challenges and there are um, individual challenges uh, when we navigate science policy, when we talk about evidence uh, based policy making, when we talk about science diplomacy in general. And so with this keyword of um, challenges. Um, what are some examples of these challenges? And perhaps can you give us a hint of how, how to address them? Sure. Um, so I think I'm gonna yeah, give you like one uh, example at the very collective institutional level and then one that is much more at the, at the individual level. Um, at, the, at the institutional level, um, I think one key challenge is, it's just like how hard it is for almost any political institution um, to invest into prevention, even though there's ample evidence about this. Um, so um, I and some colleagues, we looked into um, like the data on how like public budgets and policies change over time. And the basically the most drastic changes over time, whether it is at the UN, in democracies or autocracies are always in reaction to events. And that is, that is a reaction to like a COVID pandemic, to a Fukushima accident, uh, to 9-11 and so on. That's where like, you have the most drastic policy changes that then define the trajectory of policymaking moving forward. Um, and that is just like a very strong reality of, of policymaking, which means that if we have evidence on prevention, if we have evidence on things we need to anticipate, on things we need to do before things happen, um, you can have the best evidence, maybe presented in the best way possible with good networks and so on. It just seems that a law of institutional decision making is just to be very, very reactive. Um, and that is for many different reasons, from like limited resources to individuals, um, limited attention, uh, while there's like an unlimited number, number of issues. And that basically means that, yeah, so we need to calibrate our expectations when it comes to investing into prevention because of the reality of policymaking. Um, it also points to the fact that maybe um, we need to work on deeper level dynamics within policymaking processes than only trying to throw evidence to policymakers. Maybe there are other deeper level things to, to solve. Um, I'll give you another example that is more the individual level. Um, and I think this, this is actually very tricky to navigate. Um, when uh, you're a boundary spanner, when you're someone that cares about science, but you engage in policy, um, policy is, 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 is like a very like social process um, where you have an incentive um, to uh, signal very well what you care about and, and what you want to do. And there's often the mistake to um, put a lot of efforts into grandiose marketing or like 
um, a lot of like strong uh, signal, even though we would care about science. But that's because we think it is the way it works in politics is that to be well seen, well perceived, we need to have a really good market. And that can basically sidetrack things in a really, really bad way, because then we confuse um, signaling and, and, and persuasion with uh, the critical thinking and the step back that basically science needs to provide uh, to policy making processes. Um, and by being a boundaries panel, there will always be this tension between complying way too much with political games versus sticking to, to science. And I believe that the middle ground is actually completely possible. It is possible to um, respect very high standards of reasoning and information while still engaging in politics, um, but also um, maybe um, like opposing or like pushing back against the people that say we need to use science, but then use kind of like grandiose marketing machineries and so on. Um, and that's like a challenge. It's like double the amount of work again, um, but that's basically what um, I think is yeah key um, and is difficult for, for boundaries balance. Thank you. Thank you for, for giving us a hint, a hint of these challenges, because I think naming them and kind of being able to pinpoint them in the first place, and I think uh, what you just outlined is uh, extremely valid and we've all experienced or seen, but to articulate it very clearly, I think is, is a very first, uh, is a first important step um, to to beginning to address these. So really thank, thank you for that. With that in mind, I wanna move to another example of capacity development that combines a very open approach, but also a very um, in-depth uh, immersion of uh, Policymakers, of scientists, of people working in science diplomacy. And this brings me um, to Marga, um, who is a consultant with uh, JESTA, and here in particular, Science Diplomacy Week that took place uh, in May this year, which was the first uh, endeavor of, of this kind. As I said, there was a coalition of organizations involved, but JESTA really, really spearheaded um, the endeavor. And then, Marga, you particularly were conscious. Of uh, organizing and you know, of running the show there. So, can you give us an impression of uh, what Science Diplomacy Week is, what approach you took, um, what your experiences are, and uh, what your lessons learned are? Because it was a really great endeavor, very intense, uh, intense week with a full program, really exciting. So, can you give us a couple of impressions of what capacity development in that sense uh, looks like? Thank you very much, uh, Katharina and, and Diplo for inviting me to, to speak today and to my colleagues. Uh, great to see uh, Nicola, Maxime and, and, Bid and, and everyone and many um, uh, friendly, familiar faces in the, in the audience. So it's always fantastic to, to be with you. And, and really thank you for your collaboration because uh, everything that, that we have done uh, in Jesta has been uh, in collaboration with, with the institutions in, in, in science and diplomacy of International Geneva. So this is really a, a, a fantastic way to, to coalesce the, the expertise uh, and, 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 and put our brains together to, to advance the field. So let me just give you just a word on, on, on Jesta for those in the audience that might not uh, know about it. Jesta is a, is a relatively new uh, foundation set up by the, by the Swiss Confederation and the Canton and City of Geneva to basically anticipate the uh, future or, or not future, but the uh, scientific breakthroughs that are cooking in the labs and might become a reality soon in the in, in the span of five to 25 years. And we'll have a very uh, uh, important direct impact in uh, diplomacy, in global governance, in geopolitics. And uh, often as we have seen with the uh, different examples of scientific advances like CRISPR, um, so, uh, the, the policy and the diplomacy community come in a reactive fashion and they come after the technology is already out into the world. So how can we better anticipate what's coming from science and technology and, and even decide as a global community what, uh, what good and beneficial uh, uses of technology and what are uh, perhaps uh, unintended consequences that we should think about before they, they, they become uh, a reality. And so uh, the focus on international Geneva and the ecosystem is uh, really, really important to, to put all, all, all forces together from both the scientific and, and, and diplomatic communities uh, in Geneva as a center for uh, global governance and, and multilateral uh, policy making. And so uh, one of the, the so there, there's two main um, 
instruments that JESDA is uh, uh, operating to uh, try to advance this. One is the Science Breakthrough Radar, which is uh, an uh, um, evolving uh, assessment of all the scientific advancements, uh, yearly assessment, and how close are we uh, to being able to anticipate their impact in, 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 in policy and, and diplomacy. And the second instrument is the Science Diplomacy Week, which is a more uh, teaching and learning and uh, oriented and capacity building program. So I mentioned both because uh, we have in this, in this group and in this uh, um, webinar, uh, the participants uh, of both the, the science uh, diplomacy course that people put together with just and with GSPI, which was for us the first time that we tried to adapt this uh, science breakthrough rather into a pedagogical uh, tool. So basically, how do we take all of these scientific advancements uh, in different platforms? So JESDA now focuses on a platform on AI and, and quantum technologies. The second platform is uh, human augmentation that includes uh, genetic engineering, neurotechnologies, uh, the third one is eco regeneration and geoengineering, as you know, uh, some very controversial potential future practices to mitigate cl climate change. Uh, and the fourth one, science and diplomacy, which includes new uh, tools and instruments and new methodologies for the pedagogy of, of science diplomacy and updating the frameworks that we have used for the past 10 years uh, that might uh, not apply in this current uh, geopolitical context. And so we were very pleased to participate in the in the Diplo course because it allows for the first time to adapt this uh, this radar into a, a teaching a, a resource and, and material. And I, I really look forward to hearing from uh, some of our participants that are in the in the panel and also in the chat on how that was achieved. Because really, it's about experimenting and 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 making sure that those. Uh, uh, resources are good pedagogical tools as well. So this was a, a fantastic opportunity for us to, to work together on this together with people and, and GSBI. And then on the Science Diplomacy Week, uh, being in Geneva and, and, and of course science, International Geneva being the center, one of the centers of multilateralism, it was really important to bring people in to understand how this ecosystem works, right? The International Geneva has, of course, the UN, but many, many other institutions that form this very rich ecosystem that, uh, uh, as, as, as Nicola was saying, the interface and the boundary is there, but we are not perhaps articulating it to the full extent. And that results in science not being a full stakeholder in multilateralism, right? And, and, and multilateralism uh, being more focused on governments, on uh, IGOs, on uh, businesses, on civil society. But how do we make science a uh, full stakeholder of multilateralism? That is the goal. So the pilot uh, experiment that we wanted to do was to bring together 14 institutions in international Geneva, but also uh, more globally, not just limited to Geneva. Uh, of course, uh, Diplo and GSBI and GCSP, the Graduate Institute, UNITAR, um, the SDG Lab, IPU, CERN, as you know, also a very important actor, but also international and, and global uh, institutions such as the International Science Council or the International Network for Government Science Advice. And the idea was that to bring the, com the complementarities uh, of each of those institutions, either in science or in diplomacy or at the interface, to try to come together to, to, to have a, a, a multiplier effect. Because uh, in International Geneva, there are many offerings, there are many courses, there are many trainings, but what if we can coalesce all of it into uh, a, a single week where we all come together and we had an open forum part in which um, it was open to the public in which we could uh, engage with the community and, and the, 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 the Geneva uh, expert community, but also the public. And then a specific track that was the immersion, we would call the Science Diplomacy Immersion Week, that uh, our uh, colleague Vid was a participant. I'm very, very excited to hear his reactions. And it was a pilot to bring 30 people from all around the world to uh, be immersed in that ecosystem of international Geneva. And the methodology was designed really with this uh, experiential learning concept in mind, which I think for science diplomacy is really, the, the, you know, I don't know if the only, but the most effective way we can teach is like we can bring the scientists and the diplomats and the other stakeholders, and we can switch their roles and we can get them to experience what is the worldview, what are the constraints, what are the, uh, uh, the, the, the priorities of the other side, because we have been operating in silos. And as uh, Jovan was, uh, rightly pointing out in the chat, um, we have now come, uh, become 
uh, so separated that sometimes as scientists we say, oh, policymakers should do that, or the uh, politicians should, should be better informed about this. And, and, and it, it comes so from this lack of understanding and lack of uh, engagement at the boundary, as our colleagues have uh, previously described. So by doing this uh, experiential learning, simulation games, workshops, uh, visits, so bringing the, 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 the participants to the key institutions, to the UN, to CERN, to the WMO, uh, to the Graduate Institute, this allows them to directly be immersed in the ecosystem and to hear firsthand from the um, uh, policymakers and the practitioners uh, advancing some of these uh, science diplomacy uh, issues in all of this uh, climate or health or um, uh, AI or quantum uh, platforms, as I was saying, from uh, from from the, the perspective of just that those are the, the, the urgent um, topics that uh, diplomatic envelopes need to be thought uh, through uh, sooner rather than later. So we don't uh, have this reactive approach as we have had until until now. And so these um, uh, experiment, I would say, we think we, it went very well, and I think we all share uh, this impression. And now the um, idea is to scale it up, right? And to uh, have the Science Diplomacy Week as a tool, as an instrument to bring people together from all around the world, from the world to Geneva and from Geneva to the world. So it is really, as, as Katrina, you were saying, it is not about just the, the ecosystem in international Geneva, making sure there is a global projection. And there is um, a geographical um, context that is taken into account, because as we know, uh, the impacts of AI might not be the same in uh, the United States than in uh, other parts of the world, for example. And so how do we contextualize and make sure that those technologies and those advances and the diplomatic frameworks that we put around them are really uh, beneficial for all and not for, for just for um, for a few. And so this is the, uh, in a nutshell, what we are trying to do with your, all of your collaboration and hoping that this uh, strengthens the footprint, the joint footprint of all of the international Geneva institutions working on, on, on capacity building uh, in the science diplomacy and in between of all the, of the, of the spectrum. Thank you so much. Uh, such a uh, rich answer, so, so much content. So, I mean, if I had to, I would pick up two things, which is um, creating synergies, like building these kind of coalitions between different institutions who are engaged in science diplomacy in one way or another. And then also uh, immersion and experiential learning. I think these are some, some of the keywords that at least I picked up on. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. And as you said, next year, there's going to be a new science diplomacy week. Um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, and even including some of the lessons learned from, from this week in May. So it, it's quite an exciting time. Having said all of that, I have a bit of a challenging question for you because in a lot of conversations, uh, the question, what is science diplomacy? Is it, isn't it too broad? Is um, it too optimistic or too naive in using uh, the science diplomacy? These kind of questions or these kind of critical comments are coming up, are coming also up in kind of the broader conversation on science diplomacy. And so the concept has in the practice, uh, we've been referring to it for at least 10 years, if not more. But already over the span uh, of time, we can see that the concept is changing and the practice is changing. And based on that, the needs of practitioners are probably also changing. And basically, that's my question to you. What shifts do you see? And uh, based on that, what do we need to recognize and include in effective capacity development as science diplomacy is probably now something slightly different than it was 10 years ago. And as we're having these more critical and uh, uh, investigative conversations on what is actually science diplomacy, what are we actually doing here? So it would be really great to hear your particular, your reflections as, as a practitioner in the field who has been engaged in science diplomacy for really this, this span of time. Absolutely, I think that is the million dollar question, right? And, and right now we are hearing these voices uh, about uh, is the naive era of science diplomacy ended? And what that means is that for the first 10 years of, of the, 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 the life of the concept since it was coined, of course the practice is much longer, but the, the, as you know, the, the, the landmark report, the, the AAAS Royal Society report in 2010 that first 
um, established that uh, three pillar framework, the science and diplomacy, science for diplomacy, diplomacy for science, um, that was perceived and is perceived today as being perhaps uh, driven uh, too much from the scientific side of, of, of the equation and perhaps not too much from the realities of the diplomatic. And, and now, of course, with the, with the war in uh, Ukraine, uh, the geopolitical uh, context. So we're seeing um, actions that we hadn't seen before in terms of science, perhaps no longer being able to transcend any conflict, any difference, right? Now we are seeing very clear uh, uh, lines and we are seeing very, very strong positioning from scientific institutions that before uh, this uh, 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 war that we are living in, uh, we're uh, perhaps mm, advocating for this uh, more idealistic concept of science diplomacy. And now we have realized that science is actually not a soft thing. It is really at the core of, of what we call hard power as well. And it's a strategic uh, uh, endeavor that uh, many countries are now putting the lines and, 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 uh, and, open, and, and they are um, deciding not to uh, engage with countries. For instance, the EU is debating the values approach now. So are we, what values do we need to consider to engage or not with certain countries in scientific cooperation? And this uh, is now in tension with this other previous idea of the perhaps science for peace, science as a channel for um, keeping uh, an understanding between scientists when the other uh, channels are closed, right? Or the other the circumstances are not uh, in favor. But of course, there are also voices that say that all the, those channels should always be kept because in the long term, we have this kind of crisis, acute situations, but in the long term, in order to uh, tackle any of the challenges. So if we think about climate change, we really need a, a global multilateral uh, approach and we cannot leave anyone out. Otherwise it doesn't, you know, it, 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 is, it is not a full, a full approach that, that we need to take a collective, a collective action. So it is very uh, interesting time in terms of how this, uh, the, the, the frameworks are evolving. And I think for uh, what the implications for uh, the, the training and the, and, and the education pillars that we are all uh, interested in, in, in updating as well, we have to take that into, into account and, and perhaps um, make sure we have the, the reality um, as much as the idealistic uh, uh, dimension. I think we should not lose that because then it would, we become very cynical and a lot of uh, the you know, scientists then, I've seen them frustrated and losing hope that science can no longer be that, uh, you know, unifying bridge. And I think that's still worth keeping, right? But I think that the, the, in, in, the, in the education and the capacity building, the awareness of how the real world works and how the geopolitics uh, sometimes just dominate uh, the best intentions and the best, um, uh, yeah, intentions in, in, in scientific cooperation, that has to be taken into account and, and, and now we can no longer discount it. And finally, I'll just give you an example from three days ago, the IPBS, the, 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 the Governmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services that I was meeting in Bonn, uh, delegations of scientists, my colleagues today, I was not there. Delegations of scientists were there observing the negotiation. That's one of the ways that, uh, that you can learn about how science diplomacy intersects by going and sitting for five days in a COP or in a, in a, in a uh, meeting of the parties. And you see, you saw 140 countries debating whether the language, it was the values, the values of nature, the assessment, the, the IPBS on values of nature. And it was about three hours of discussion among 140 countries, whether the wording should be science-based policy or evidence-based policy. So we really need, uh, scientists and diplomats to work together because when it comes to the negotiation and it comes to that question both sides need to be equipped to 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 have an answer to that imagine and, and then that multiplied by 140 when it comes to the multilateral negotiation so we really need the awareness of how the, each of the two worlds uh, uh have, what what is um coming from the scientific side and from the diplomatic side and then we need the boundary and they have to come together to these negotiations. Otherwise, if it's only the scientists and if it's, or if it's only the diplomat, they are not equipped to answer that question and to negotiate and to arrive to a, 
a, a, a collective a statement or resolution or whatever, uh, whatever is being negotiated. So this is an example from just two days ago that really shows the importance of having the two communities engage and learning about how the system works in the multilateral negotiations in order to advance on the global challenges. Yeah, th thank you so much. I think it's really important to highlight that in our discussions here, the kind of naive phase of, of science diplomacy is, is really over and we need to recognize the impact of geopolitics and the, the relevance of geopolitics in almost everything that we do. With that in mind, I would like to bring the focus back more specifically on, on capacity development and what lessons we have learned so far and how we can improve in the future. And this brings me um, to Vit who joined us for the online course last year and also for Science Diplomacy Week. So extremely rich experience there. And with basically my question for you is, can you share some, some experiences, some, some positive elements, um, some lessons learned, but perhaps can you also give us some hints on what elements we could perhaps improve um, in the future? Really curious to hear what, what your reflections are. Uh, thanks, Katarina, and it's really nice to see uh colleagues and friends uh, that have spent quite a bit of time, uh, both in person and online. Thanks for all, uh, everyone for joining. Um, so I've been working at the interface of uh, biomedical science policy and diplomacy over the past 15 years, uh, beginning with bilateral context and now in more of a regional context. And I've also been interested in the conceptual frameworks of science diplomacy as it applies to my work. So in that context, I came across the first edition of the course being offered by Diplo Foundation in collaboration with GSPI and JESTA back in 2021. And there I met um, Katharina, Max, Nicholas, and Marga. Um, and following this, I participated in the inaugural Science Diplomacy Immersion Week in May of 2022. Um, so I, I would say from, from both these experiences, there are a couple of key takeaways for me personally. Uh, the first one is sustainable development goals. Um, I think the Diplo course expanded the understanding for me on how my work on health, which is SDG3, um, is linked to other SDGs such as energy, climate, and land, and why it is important to pay attention to SDGs in the first place. Uh, the second is multilateralism, uh, and this is where JESDA comes in and offered a very unique opportunity to meet multilateral organizations um, in International Geneva working on SDGs, as well as emerging technologies and also introduced us to its work on anticipatory science diplomacy with lots of simulations and scenarios that we um, played out with, with my colleagues. Again, that came from, I believe, uh, 20 countries. Um, and GSPI, uh, I, I remember that, uh, that, that module quite uh, well because I saw I, I interacted with them during the Diplo course, but also at the uh, just uh, uh, immersion week. They spoke to, the, uh, again, speakers have already mentioned this, so it's a little tough for me, but I'm gonna sound a bit repetitive. Um, so things that stood out for me were the uh, decision-making under uncertainty um, and the challenges of working at the science policy interface, especially the, uh, the misfits of alignment, timing, communication, and use. Um, and I think overall from my, both these experiences, I got to meet amazing peers from diverse sectors, career stages, geographies, perspectives, and experiences. And I think over time, this community of boundary spanners uh, will be instrumental uh, to act as translators, liaisons, or facilitators of all the issues that, that have come up uh, even in this session uh, in the multilateral context. Uh, but perhaps more immediately a uh, question for the organizations is, how do you leverage the unique opportunity of having this rich expertise that you have gathered in the room into your own work? Um, and I think Marga sort of uh, touched upon this. Maybe we could, a, a concrete mechanism uh, could be thinking of uh, placement uh, opportunities, uh, whether it's a week or a month, uh, but to actually be in that immersive atmosphere and learn about the other community, their language, their issues, their priorities. Um, but I also want to kind of uh, uh, distinguish capacity development between uh, 
learning about science diplomacy versus learning how to conduct science diplomacy. I think we need to be very clear what is the objective here and does this capacity development reflect reality? Again, we just touched upon these um, uh, uh, aspects. And beyond courses and immersions, what opportunities are actually available? Are they at the multilateral, regional, or national organizations? Who are they for? What are the points of entry? And I think we should provide a realistic picture of the available career paths. Uh, which brings to my last point, uh, which is uh, we also touched upon the, um, uh, the toolkits for science diplomacy during the Diplo course. Um, and this would vary depending on whether you're a scientist, a policy uh, maker or a policy wonk or a diplomat. But then how do we then incorporate uh, some of these specific elements into the training, whether this is anticipation foresight, foreign affairs, negotiation, communication, scientific process, risk management, ethics, policy, law, economics, because all of them have a bearing on uh, science diplomacy. Um, so that's sort of, uh, uh, I think, my takeaways and, and perhaps suggestions for what uh, you could consider. Um, I would like to close with saying I'm uh, very grateful for the financial support that uh, Diplo and just uh, provided very kindly and which has opened doors and initiated conversations for me in the multilateral space. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for these reflections. I, I mean, again, a lot. Thank you so much for, for that. What I picked up on in particular, what is some question that resonated with me is this question, um, are we teaching, uh, are we providing capacity building on science diplomacy or on practicing science diplomacy on the concept or on, on the actual practice and how, how do we distinguish that? What is the exact aim and how do we really get to, to the practice part? I think that's a really important question. So thank you so much um, for that. We had a really interesting discussion in the chat. I only saw it um, uh, on, on the sidelines, but that's why I have my colleague um, Pavlina Itilson. Pavlina was also a lecturer in the science diplomacy course, in particular on this intersection of science diplomacy and sustainable development and the sustainable development goals. Um, with that in mind, you've been following the chat. Can you give us an impression of the discussion there? And are there any questions we should bring into our discussion at this point? I have to admit it's very nice to see many participants and also people who uh, created parts of the courses like Tara in the participants list and listening to us right now. So I've been quite busy in the direct chat, I have to admit. But in general, we do have questions and one is, um, specifically on our Diplo expertise related, and that is um, the position of small and developing countries in this uh, setting, in the setting of science diplomacy. So Vahur uh, is interested in science diplomacy of smaller countries and is asking how to balance the lack of similar capacities in science and in diplomacy towards the big nations in, uh, in terms of size and in terms of impact. Uh, so the smaller and developing countries are more reliant on the developments from the big countries, and he believes it's an unresearched field. And also we have a question about who should be the audience for the training directed in science diplomacy. Should it be diplomats? Should it be general public, for example, that they understand the impact on policy making? And I leave you to to ask the question, Katarina, to pick the person who will answer, but I will also say that we have Yoma, so you can you can decide to whether whether to involve him or not in this answer, as it is our métier here. Thank, Thank you, you, Katarina. Thank you, Pavlina, for 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 the concise summary. And I know this must have been a challenge. And let me just echo: it's really great to see. Uh, course participants and everyone who contributed to the course here again which kind of furthers the conversation and, and which is great to see that we're building this community of of practitioners and um, with that in mind this question on participants from uh, developing countries versus developed countries and how, how to balance that um Johan, would you like to to add some some reflections on that Hi, 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 Kat, hi, everybody. I hi. was a bit uh, hijacked into this. I prefer to be 
in text chat, but uh, no, just 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 a few 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 reflections. Uh, we will be sharing the few. I still remember Nicola when we discussed four or five years ago boundary spanner idea, and I'm happy that it took off in the in your activities. And uh, we have been trying exactly to to with the small and developing countries to do it. And after this experience, we celebrate this year 20 years, and we would like to invite you to join us for the event in Malta, whoever can make it, uh, which will be Digital Diplomacy and Governance Summit. And there are probably three um, lessons that we learned, if I, if I can say. The first one is that uh, uh, the more you try to organize it uh, scientifically, the more likely you can slide into, into unrealistic construction. To the large extent, uh, boundary spanning is knitting. It's a lot of listening, it's engagement, it's understanding political context. And there were a few, few interventions along, along these lines. Now it's a bit strange that you need to do it for science, but you should not, you will should be very careful in using scientific methods of generalizing methods of modernity. And I just put a few points where we can learn from Nikola Tesla, Fibonacci, Al Harizmi, and people who were the greatest boundary spanners in history, I would say, and few Geneva thinkers, Bonnet and the others. And that was exactly what they did. They basically, it was listening, engaging, moving beyond the comfort zone. There was, there's the first caveat, don't be too scientific in, uh, in, uh, in trying to get boundary spanning active. Uh, second point is that you have to integrate it into daily activities. At Diplo, we have concept of cognitive proximity, which means that, for example, Kat and I understand each other very well through the exchanges, through discussion, and we can develop relatively fast courses and activities due to this knowledge proximity. It's not easy to do it in big systems, but that is the, probably the key challenge of many organizations ahead of us, how to increase the knowledge proximity. And third point is on small and developing countries. Fortunately, uh, their delayed start in this process could be an, an advantage. The main problem of the big system, and I'm referring to the universities, governments, companies, is basically that they went too far with specialization and it is very difficult for them to undo it. Therefore, the first lesson for small and developing countries is not to copy experience from the developed countries and big systems because this is not going to provide a solution and we are trying with our courses to do it. Therefore, like with M-Pesa in e-commerce and e-banking, we may have some solution coming from uh, prima facie unexpected places, which are in small and developing countries. And those are three points. Don't be too scientific in, uh, in uh, making boundary spanning as a concept, because it's human concept. It requires engagement, listening, empathy. Second point is increase cognitive proximity in your organization in courses, and we can share some of the practices that we use. And third one, uh, for developing countries, try to find your solution like MPSA and avoid uh, just copying experiences from um, more advanced countries. That would be beneficial for small and developing countries, but also uh, for developed world, because uh, like to David, many countries are uh, copying experience from MPSA. We may have something similar in science and digital diplomacy. Over to you, Kat. Thank you so much, Johan. Um, I just recently took up knitting. I didn't think about it as a science diplomacy practice, but I think it, it might enrich my science diplomacy practice. We might include it as part of a capacity development. Um, and I think your, your comment on boundary spanning um, picked up in the chat. Um, Nikita Latu also contributed to the course with uh, material and resources and in the teaching uh, brought in the concept of uh, co-production, which I think is also um, really, really useful. So thank you for that. Um, we're really short on time, which sometimes happens when there's a lot to discuss, um, which we experienced today. What I would like to do is give a final word to each of our speakers with the two questions in mind that we heard um, from Pavlina, which is uh, first uh, this question of developing and developed countries, how to support developing countries in particular, given the disparities and capacities. And then second, this question of 
who do we train? What is capacity building for? Um, do we train diplomats and scientists? Do we train them together? Should we open up to the wider public? How can, how can we navigate this? So perhaps if you can, with these two questions in mind, I would like to give each of you, our speakers, um, just a very quick um, final word, which means we go a little bit over time, but I'm sure the audience will forgive me in order to hear from you uh, one last time. I would suggest we go in the same order as before. So this brings me um, to Nicola. Final words from you. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. And it's been really a fascinating discussion. So I'll be very quick on, on who to train. I think we need to really go at different levels uh, because in order to overcome the misfits that we talked about, there are, we need to work at the level of incentives, for example, in academia, uh, which is pushing more of, you know, researchers to make publications, peer reviews, etc. These are really sort of deep structures that are sort of hard to move, but that we need to move all, over time. So that's a level where we need to act, but also at the individual level. And I think that, um, you know, there's value in, we've done trainings and interactions with researchers when it comes to really focusing on their reality, some of them with decision makers. Uh, and also we are planning to test, uh, you know, um, environments that combines them as well so i think you can really work on those different levels but definitely i think it's not only for science diplomats uh, but for people who may be a bit more researchers but do policy engagement or policy actors that interact with scientists the the boundaries are really blurred in that space so you need to uh, reach a broad spectrum and on and on uh, developing countries um i think it, it's a very fair question um when we think about science diplomacy and especially the diplomacy for science, there's clearly a notion of power politics in there when diplomacy can really, if it's a strong diplomacy, can really open doors for your own scientists in your country. But I think as we talked about that evolving notion of science diplomacy and policy, <clears throat> it's becoming really much more about opportunities for impactful projects between scientists and policy actors. And I think that. Uh, well, more often than not, the most relevant data is often in developing countries where phenomenons happen, and there's really value to collaborate with those actors to then sort of, you know, uh, develop um, interesting insights uh, on global challenges. So um, I tend to agree with Jovan, uh, or I hope uh, that uh, those countries can have an opportunity to sort of leapfrog uh, some earlier challenges there. Thank you. Um, so on, on who to train, so ideally everyone and including the public, of course, um, but the thing is we have limited resources, so we need to prioritize. And I think here it's probably like higher value to train the people at the interface uh, the intermediaries, the, the boundaries panels, um, because here we, we don't only face the need for more skills and motivation is that we also need to recognize their profession. Uh, academics and civil servants and diplomats are recognized profession in the world. Like it's easy to, to, to talk about like what they generally do and to associate meaning to, to their work. When it comes to boundary spanners, it is blurry. Uh, these people often think they don't fit anywhere. Well, in fact, they do. And I think giving them training is a way to basically label them and giving a vocabulary to this field. So I would like really prioritize these, these um, kind of left out intermediary actors. Um, on um, Western versus global South dynamics and especially regarding uh, where the science comes from, um, this is um, a critical issue, um, but there are some nuances in there. Um, typically um, the, the scientific landscape is deeply unequal, but we still, able to know that uh, the climate is changing and this is a major threat to humanity, right? Um, so like we can still know a lot of things that are quite important that can guide decision making. So it's not because the source of information is deeply unequal that we should necessarily reduce a lot of trust in it. Um, I think the problem I see is that um, policy making takes a very detailed uh, nature on it's about the implementation and implementation happens locally. And it's hard to implement something locally if there's no local expertise or local data uh, or like local experts that can actually guide the implementation. Um, so I think now we kind of need to 
move a bit away from like maybe like big picture problems on which we have very good evidence and reverse the question and say, okay, what does that mean at the implementation level, local level? And by design, that then requires local sources of information and thus funding. And Maga, over to you, if you if want to share some final reflections. Yeah, just one word very quickly. I think the capacity has to be at two levels, the development of capacity. At not just So we normally tend to focus at the individual level, meaning programs that we can have people come and take a program or a course, but it's, all, it's equally important the institutional level. So we have to operate at the two levels because in, in the chat there were all these comments about pipeline, about jobs, about professionals. So it is such a new space, right? Science diplomacy as a profession doesn't really exist. There are very few jobs that have that those words explicitly in the job description, right? Most of it is actually implicit. And, and there is some work to be done to identify how your expertise and your skills and your knowledge uh, match those that are required in the position, for example, to work at a, a multilateral organization that deals with technology issues. So those will not be explicit uh, uh, job descriptions that you would recognize as science diplomacy. So, so I think part of this capacity development, a key part is to help people understand from where they are, how they can get there, how they can translate those skills. And in the demand side, the institutions, the diplomatic uh, institutions, the, the foreign ministries, the, the multilateral, um, and also the businesses, this is really not limited to, to, to just the science and diplomacy strictly. Um, how can they incorporate this expertise and they can uh, make sure this new, uh, I would say, pathway has a home? Otherwise, the, the risk and the challenge is to train people for something that doesn't really exist. And this is something that we have to be very careful about. Otherwise, it creates a little bit of a bubble and then it, it comes with frustration. And, and so I would say this is the individual and the, the institutional levels. That would be my message. And uh, I just wanted to invite you to uh, be I put it in the chat. We're going to have a session exactly on this at the next JESDA Summit. October 12 to 14 in Geneva, a session about curriculum and capacity development in science diplomacy. You are all invited and uh, you can check the link and make sure you attend. It's virtual and in person. So hopefully see, see many of you uh, in Geneva then. Thank you. And thanks for this great, great event. Thank you so much, Marga. And um, last but not least, uh, Lid, over to you, final reflections and comments to, to round us off and, and basically close the event. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my perspectives today are of a practitioner of science diplomacy coming from the global south. So what I share are general comments, but perhaps with a cautionary note and may at times seem, seem uh, a bit provocative. Uh, so I would urge us all to recognize and acknowledge that the power centers of science diplomacy are almost all concentrated in a handful of countries in the global north. You can think of Washington, D.C., London, Paris, Geneva, Brussels, Vienna, Barcelona, to name a few. So the frameworks and narratives of science diplomacy are predominantly drawn up in Global North, and the directionality of discourse tends to be from Global North to Global South. Um, there are also disparities in resources available for scholarship, training, and practice of science diplomacy. And this has a direct consequence, as, as this has come up in the chat and some of the comments. There's a real difference in terms of what you can influence and the impact that you can have, even within the science diplomatic uh, space. Uh, we should also be mindful of the colonial and imperial legacies and prevent those tendencies from creeping in. So are there alternative frameworks that might compete or even contradict existing ones? So that's my first point. The second is operationalization. We tend to celebrate and even glorify the public outcomes of science diplomacy, declarations, agreements, research infrastructures, high-level visits, while much of it happens behind the scenes and often confidentially. It is not even as glamorous Instead, it can be mundane and frustrating. And equal, if not more, of science diplomacy happens at the bilateral level. Um, so even here, we mostly talk about ambassadors, attaches, diplomats. Some of them are self-styled and scientists posted in host countries. What about the local staff working for these organizations providing institutional memory and cultural context in which science diplomacy happens, uh, who rarely get mentioned? 
uh, brings up a broader question. What does it take to actually operationalize science diplomacy at national or international levels? Who makes it happen? What resources are needed? And what are the processes involved? Um, so my last point, uh, again, we touched upon this. Uh, Science diplomacy is the new name for what has been and still is widely known as international science and technology cooperation, or simply international relations or international affairs with a hyphen next to it, whether it's health, energy, so on. While science diplomacy may seem to have grown in importance, I submit we ought to be humble in accepting its limitations. Um, and might I add of multilateralism itself. Uh, we should do away with this implied notion that every actor shares the same objectives and goals. There are greater forces, trade, defense, politics that are at play at the national level. Just to give an example, um, how many of us really think the pandemic is over? So issues of intellectually property waivers, uh, vaccine apartheid and new COVID variants have been a wake up call directly challenging science diplomacy, especially if it was meant to address the SDGs. So we ought to be grounded to be able to understand where and why or why not science diplomacy worked. And we need to have a common understanding about what is and isn't science diplomacy, uh, especially when we go about hashtagging it, uh, lest we end up naively chasing a mirage, mistaking it for a panacea. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Witt. This uh, worked fantastically as, as final words. Um, lots of support in, in the chat at the moment. So. Lots of appreciation for your comments. Uh, all that's left for me to do is to close the session. We already went a bit over time. Um, so thank you for everyone who stayed with us until the very end. I think it was well worth it. Thank you to our speakers who joined us today uh, in this discussion. We will, of course, continue the discussion on capacity development. It's quite clear from this session today that there's a lot to be explored and a lot to be learned and a lot to be implemented in our capacity development efforts. So thank you so much for that. I think it served really well for inspiration, but also as a call for the continuation of these kind of discussions. So thank you so much for that. With that, um, I will close. We will follow up as usual with the summary of the discussion and, Recording and stopped. links to uh, Recording things, in progress. Uh, happening over the next couple of months uh, and next year. You heard a lot of examples from all the organizations represented here today. So a lot uh, is, uh, is ahead of us ahead of us. Thank you so much and um, see you soon.